Our next guest is an Australian baseball representative, a pitcher for the national team in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, South Korea. Post-career, he worked in the game as a development manager at state and national level for baseball, as well as a scout for the US, for US baseball teams. Now he's a teacher at Vic University at the Footscray campus where he teaches subjects in the diploma of sport and continues to do scouting for US baseball teams. Welcome, Grant Weir. How are you, Max? Really nice to talk to you. Great to have you on today, Grant, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, you made it to the Australian baseball team and represented the nation in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, South Korea. Can you backtrack a, f- a bit further and tell us about your early days as a baseballer and how you fell in love with the game? Uh, well, I, I could backtrack, yeah. So I was, I'm, I've got an older brother and he was a cricketer, a very good cricketer, actually. He played um, premier cricket for Fitzroy then, not Fitzroy Doncaster. And he's 12 years older than me and he started playing at high school. And when I was about five or six, I was going to games. It was in the winter then, so he was playing district cricket in the summer and uh, baseball was winter. And um, I just started, and I think I had my first game when I was about seven in the under-13s at Faulkner Park. So that was my starting. And then I, I, but I was still cricket, cricket, cricket all through the summer. And um, I got to about 15 or 16 max and I had to make a decision. Um, as to which one to play, and um, I love cricket, but I wasn't probably going to play for Australia at that at that point. And in those times when you were playing baseball as a you know thirteen t- as a teenager, can you tell us about the competition back then? Baseball isn't the biggest sport in Melbourne, Victoria, but it is it is existing and it, it is around. What, what's what was the competition like back then? Yeah, pretty similar. A lot, there was a lot of clubs, like a, a few of the clubs that I played for don't exist anymore. Um, some of the, So I started with a club called Paran um, that doesn't exist anymore. They played at Como Park where Paran thirds and fourths play cricket. Uh, and I remember I grew up in Springvale, so I was out in the suburbs. But I remember my mum putting uh, getting on a train certain Tuesday nights and we'd go to training at Como Park. So my mum and my dad just took me everywhere. So I, I was pretty lucky. Um, but, um, yeah, baseball, people know about it. And we'll, we'll talk about it later about, you know, is it a minor sport? Um, in some cases, yeah, it is. But in other things that happen in baseball, no, there's no other sport in the country does things that baseball does. So we'll, we'll chat about that as we go. Yeah. And, Grant, you... You were Australian baseball representative uh, and you went to the Olympics. Before the Olympics, there was an event, a tragic event that occurred uh, from a plane trip from uh, Bangalore to uh, Seoul in South Korea where the Olympics was being held. And sadly, uh, there was some tensions between North Korea and South Korea before the Olympics. Ten months out, uh, sadly, these two South uh, North Koreans um, – they distinguished a bomb uh, with a radio on the plane and, um, and sadly 115 people passed away. And that sort of eventuated uh, out of the Olympics and South Korea winning the bid to host the Olympics and North Korea unsuccessfully um, in their campaign. They wanted to co-host the games, but they, un- they were unsuccessful in, in achieving that. So that caused a few tensions. When that happened 10 months before the Olympic Games and you were here in Australia preparing for that tournament, how did that make you feel knowing that there were those tensions sort of going on between the two countries and, and there were some tragic events happening? Yeah, look, I'm really vague on it, to be honest. I, I was 25 years of age. I wasn't wor- as worldly max as I am now. Um, I remember it, but I don't remember taking too much notice of it. Uh, and when you go to the Olympics, it, anything can happen, and it, it actually it doesn't matter. And I reckon ten months out, I didn't even know whether we were going to the Olympics because we hadn't qualified. So I was really disappointed. I played well in a, in the qualifying tournament, but we hadn't qualified. Cuba pulled out, so there was a whole lot of stuff going on in the world at that point. Cuba boycotted those Olympics. Cuba pulled out, and I reckon it was with six months to go, we took Cuba's spot. So we weren't originally in. And remember also, it was a demonstration sport. So I don't classify myself as an Olympian, even though I went to the Olympics. So it was a demonstration sport and Korea, the being baseball being the number one or number two sport, um, I, I 
we got to go and I was the happiest human being on earth. I had, if I go right back to when I was five and six years of age, I was an Olympic freak. I loved the Olympics. I looked forward to the Olympics. I read all the Olympic books. I knew everything about Olympics, but I just didn't ever think that baseball would ever be involved. So I got lucky, Max. Yeah. And when you found out, when you guys qualified for the 1988 Olympics, how happy were you uh, as a baseballer? Uh, I remember I was running a, um, I was running a school baseball clinic because I was a development manager for Baseball Victoria. And it was up in um, oh, north of Shepparton. And there was no mobile phone, so I had to ring up. Um, I rang, had to ring the national office up to find out if I'd made the team. And I rang up and I got the news and I was in this school, little school. It was a tiny little school. And it was at lunchtime and I remember just running out and, and, and I had tears. I was crying that I was going to go to the Olympics as a baseballer. Um, so, yeah, don't um, – it was the absolute highlight of my life. Apart from, a, apart from a son's getting born and, you know, other yeah. things like that, Max. Yeah, that's, it's an amazing achievement um, to be able to travel internationally and, and be a part of an Olympics. What were some of your biggest highlights and memories from the event? Uh, from the Olympics? Well, we were done in the first week. We were finished. And uh, we finished fifth. We missed out on a um, – we, we had a, a one-run game. We got beaten two, two to one against Korea in extra innings. We went to the 10th innings in front of a packed stadium. It was just packed. If we hadn't won that game, we would have gone into the medal round. Now, as it turns out, we finished fifth, which was fine. That was, you know, pretty good. Uh, we got beaten by US. We beat Canada. And then we got beaten by Korea in by one run. But now I'm at the Olympics. We, and, you know, I've, I've dreamed about this moment. And I'm there for the next week by my, you know, with no games. And we've been training and training and training. So yeah. my sort of day looked like this, Max. I'd wake up at about 9 or 10. I'd go out to the athletics. And what a really close mate of mine was David Coleman. And he had finished his long jump event. Um, and so him and I would go out to the athletics or we'd go out with other people. We'd then um, come back to the village, have some, have some food. We would then go out to, I went to the basketball a lot. I knew quite a lot of the basketball girls and boys. I was friends with them. I saw the girls beat um, Russia. I saw the men beat Spain. Um, I was on the court after the girls beat Russia, high-fiving, and, um, and then I went to the gymnastics, I went to the cycling, and then, we went, then we'd go out. And then I think the earliest I got home in that last week was five. That was five <laughs> o'clock earliest. I was getting home at seven or eight, two hours wow. sleep, and then bang, after the athletics. I saw, um, I saw Ben Johnson beat Carl Lewis in the 100 metres in the world record time, and then two days later he... He was out. Um, I saw Debbie Flintoff King win the win the uh, gold medal for Australia, and in the 400 hurdles, and I got to sing the national anthem um, with her. So, yeah, there was a few highlights. <laughs> yeah, and because you were a part of the Australian team in that Olympics, did you get any special access to to watching games and any um, any really, yeah. really really cool? Yeah, we had a pass, so we had the athletes pass. And that got you in some places. Um, but then, you know, being a little, yeah, we, were, we were confident young men at that point, Max. Yeah. But we worked out that the security could stop you, but if you actually kept walking, they weren't allowed to touch you because you're an Olympic athlete. <laughs> so we played that card. <laughs> we, just, we just kept walking. And, uh, Smart. Yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. I saw, yeah, lots of basketball because I was a basketball nut. Uh, yeah, as I said, cycling, gymnastics. And then athletics every day, every day. Yeah. You know, that was um, really just fantastic and exciting. And the weather was great. And, you know, we'd been training our guts out for about that six-month period when we found out we were going to go. So, you know, we'd been just training, training. So that last week became party time. And, yeah. And then I got really, because um, we hadn't had too much sleep and we'd, we'd had a lot of fun, I got, we all got quite sick. We had to travel back to via Japan to come home and play some game. And I had to play, I had to pitch in that game and I was just rock, really sick. Um, but yeah. that all went out for about four or five innings and, and then jumped on a plane and came home. So, yeah, very exciting times. Yeah. And 
it was a new environment for you uh, being in South Korea in Seoul. What what was the differences and, and did that add to the experience? Um, well, look, we travelled a fair bit anyway with baseball and, and baseball being the number one sport in, in Korea, Japan, Chinese Taipei. We, I hadn't been to Korea before, but I'd been to Japan a couple of times and then I travelled. My first Australian team was 85 when we went to Canada. Um, when I was about the fifth emergency Max, I was yeah. not going to make that team and we had a couple of injuries and someone signed professionally and all of a sudden I was off. And luckily, um, it was a good lesson because I think I was the fifth emergency or fourth emergency or something. And they said, look, you're not going to make the team, but do you want to just keep training with the squad, the Victorian guys in the squad? You're not going to make the team though. And I, of course, said, yeah, why wouldn't I? This is the most exciting thing ever to happen to me. Whereas I remember another player said, no, nah, I'm not going to make the team. I'm not going to train. And I went ahead of him. And then from there, yeah, um, that if I hadn't have done that and hadn't have made that team in 85 that went to Edmonton, I don't think I would have made a team after that that would have ended up at the Olympics. So I think it's one when I'm talking to my students or young players, just grasp it. Just, just take it and just say yes and, you know, just do whatever you, you can. And you mentioned there you, uh, when you're talking to your young students. so. That's, I'm guessing, part of your role there when you're talking to young baseballers is your scouting job. Um, and you're, you're scouting for the US. Uh, you know, uh, two te- you've been scouted, scouting for, for oh, two teams, teams now. Yeah. Three teams, so yeah. I was with Houston Astros and then I, I was with the Angels for about 15 years. Yeah. Uh, and then I've been with the Baltimore Orioles for about the last two to three years now, which is really exciting. And uh, it's always been a part-time job. So yeah. it's something that I fit around my full-time work and when I was playing and coaching baseball and I, um, I take annual leave to go off and scout. Um, yeah. And I've signed, uh, I think it's about 12 or 13 players over the years. Yes. Um, and I've had uh, three get into AAA and I had one, Richard Thompson, played in the big leagues, played in the major leagues for the Angels in oh, for about three or four years. So he was a kid out of Sydney who we signed. And yeah, he, he made a career in the big leagues and I've got my name next to him. So he was yeah. a big leaguer and it's got Scout Grant Weir, which is, which is pretty cool. And um, yeah, so it's yeah. good looking at talent and, and seeing if it can go to the absolute major leagues. Um, before, Max, I was talking about things that happened in baseball. There was a, I, I won't name the player, but there was a young kid who I tried to get to sign uh, for the Orioles this year. And he, um, he was 16 years of age, or he might be 17 now, out of New South Wales. I liked him, really liked him. I'd coached in the, him in an under-15 Australian team uh, two years ago in Panama at the World Championships. And we offered him 400,000 US dollars. And we didn't get half, well, we got halfway. So this kid signed, he's 16 years of age, to put his name on the paper it was also, I think it was 750,000 US dollars. So that's wow. over a million Australian dollars at 16 years of age to sign a piece of paper to say that he'll play baseball for not us, another team. Wow. Now, there's no other sport in the country where that happened um, around that time, or there's no other sport in the country where that will happen this year. So Major League Baseball is this big organisation and World Baseball is this massive organisation. So, uh, and I'm I'm really uh, happy and um, to to be involved in 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 that worldwide look for ball players. Yeah, we're speaking to Grant Weir, who is an Australian baseball representative, um, and now does some scouting. As we speak about that right now, with your scouting, Grant, is that the role? Part of that is that getting baseball players from Australia over to the US. How does your role exactly work there? Yeah, that's exactly. I'm the Australian scout for Baltimore. Yeah. Um, so I I look for talent. I look for athletes. I look for you know baseball players who I think can play in the big leagues. Now that's that's a big jump, and so there's a lot of crystal ball gazing in that. You've got to take a kid at 16, and in say in 10 years' time at 26, he is going to play in the big leagues. Um, that's hard. So we look at a whole range of things, um, but we compare that 16 year old to a big leaguer. And that's a big, big, big jump. Um, yeah, so uh, we have scouts all over the world. Every major league club has scouts all over the world. So I might recommend a player 
And then my boss would look at that player and compare that player to Japan, Korea, Asia. Then his boss comes in and now compares that player to Asia plus Latin America and Europe. Now, if it's a really big sign, another boss comes in over the top of us and compares that player to every player in the world. Every 16-year-old baseballer in the world gets compared to the player that I recommended down here. So we have me, then we have my boss, then we have a cross-checker, and then we have a cross-checker. If it gets to the the general manager will come in, Mm. the big boss will come in and oversee the whole thing. Um, Now, if it's a kid for $20,000, $30,000, I can probably do it myself. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's a really advanced system that we've got with lots of people and now statistics sports mm. analytics in the scouting industry is really big which came out of moneyball the, the book and the movie what's that 10 years ago now i suppose and part of the scouting do you look at players is a big part of it looking at players from the australian baseball league um and and how is the australian baseball league because it's been running in australia and can you tell us a bit more about it yeah, well, look, I don't look at too many players in the Australian Baseball League because they're all older guys. Yeah. You know, they're the 20, 21, 22, 23. We want to try and sign kids at 16, 17, 18, 19, not much older than that. Yeah. yeah. Now, the Australian Baseball League's been around. I played in the first year of it. Um, before that was the Claxton Shield. It's still known as the Claxton Shield or they played for the Shield. And it used to be just a state versus state. You go away for 10 days, play against each other twice and have a fun. Uh, I think it was after coming back from Korea, 1989, probably 1990, that the Australian Baseball League started. It's gone through a few forms um, for, a, for a while. Major League Baseball backed it enormously and poured lots of money into it. Uh, every team now is owned by private owners. So it's, it's now at that situation. Uh, it's still involved with Baseball Australia, but uh, it's a bit like soccer there. Uh, they're trying to separate each other out. So Baseball Australia can just look at junior development, the national teams, you know, world championships, Olympics, all of that. And then the league will run itself over here with the private owners. Um, when baseball, uh, Major League Baseball pulled out two or three years ago, that was like a crossroads. You know, they stopped pouring money in um, and a lot of money in. And then the league had to look after itself. And it's hard. It's <laughs> And it's hard for baseball because you play a lot of games. Thursday, Friday, two games, Saturday sometimes, and probably a game Sunday. So it's hard to get big crowds for four nights in a row. Mm. So Thursday, you know, not much. Sunday, not much because there's a lot of baseball on Sunday. So Friday nights and Saturday nights down at Altona Stadium. So that's been the home of baseball. That was my office there for a long while. Just near uh, Brimbank as well, not not far away from from where no, I no, no. It was. That's, yeah. yeah, that's Western suburbs, and yep. it's building. It's it's you know we I suppose we've been saying this for years and years, but they've just done an enormous job. And um, Je- uh, uh, the the owner of the um, of the uh, oh, it's called the Melbourne Aces, yep. also is a, a a part owner now of the Melbourne Storm. So he he bought a big um, lot of um, sort of knowledge into the game. He's a baseball guy. And he, like, last year the crowds were really good. And the Aces won the championship. That helped. They had some great players. They had a guy called Delman Young who played 10 years in the big league. You know, this guy is a bit of a legend in the big league. He came out and played for the Aces. So we're starting to get these really good major league baseballers who – might want to try to get back into the game or they finish the major league career or come out here. So the standard of play is just enormous. Yep. And let's look at the game at a, at a lower scale. Uh, you've worked, you've worked in the game um, as a development manager at local at, sorry, at state and national level at the grassroots level. How, how is it developing? And, and, when when you were in those roles, how, how how did you how did what were some of the successes and challenges you were facing? Oh, the challenges was always a crowded marketplace. You know, just um, every sport, and there's you know hundred hundred sports. Everyone wants that six year old, seven year old, eight year old. So you're up against that, and you're up against um, you know forty cricket, forty soccer, 
You know, that you're up against those sports who have got massive uh, marketing campaigns, national advertising marketing campaigns that we could never do. So I just had to work smarter um, with far less resources <laughs> trying to um, tap into that school market. T-ball was, was and still is a massive um, sport or um, uh, modified sport in, in schools. So we always had that sort of base. Um, yeah. The kids knew how to put the glove on and how to swing the bat. Um, but yeah, it was all, it's tough because, um, especially in some areas, like I, I, I'm a life member of the Melbourne Baseball Club and around that area, Scotch College is just up the road. So a lot of the kids went to private schools. Now baseball wasn't a sport in private schools. So we were never getting that really good athlete at that club who, because that kid was playing footy or cricket with Scotch. Yeah. or Melbourne Grammar or, you know. And I know you went to Geelong Grammar. Um, not many baseballers have come out of Geelong Grammar, mm. you know, it's because the, the, the sport's not played there. So, um, yeah, but there is a, like a club north board at the moment has, um, has got a really good um, connection with Trinity, for example. Trinity have now got Trinity uh, College or Grammar have got three or four teams now playing. So... That was always, you're up against massive marketing campaigns and every little kid, uh, every little boy and girl wants to play cricket or footy because that's what they see all over the place. So that, that was the tough thing. We had some great success and, and the game has grown, you know, the game is growing. Um, and look, I, my last coaching job was, was out in the West out near you there, Max. So I coached yeah. Sunshine Baseball Club for a couple of years and mm. that club's thriving, like really doing so well um, right now. Juniors, women, um, veteran teams, big, big club. Yeah, it's brilliant to hear that, uh, you know, the Sunshine Baseball is thriving and the sport is growing. It, it's, a, it's a great sport, I think. Uh, it's great to watch. You know, you get to whack a ball. I don't think too many people would deny that. So um, it's it's good to hear that that it was, it was growing. Um, now, with... You, the recent Black Lives Matter movement showcases the value and importance of inclusion and acceptance in communities. What are some of the traits you see in vibrant, inclusive communities and where do you think we are today as a society? Um, you know, and this is in relation to, to sport as well. Oh, that's a big question, Max. Don't get, we've, you said 20, 25 minutes. I need about three <laughs> days for this because we've got a lot of views. Um, yeah. yeah, look, aren't we getting better? Um, we are getting better, but uh, I think sometimes we kid ourselves as a nation. We we hide behind just a few little examples. Um, and until we can identify that, yeah, we, we're, we're going okay, but we, we still have a lot of issues with regard to, to race, diversity, inclusion, um, until we, we own up to it. And our history, well, we can't move forward. Um, I think some good. I was. We had um, drinks last night with a with a few people. This was obviously our topic, and we we need to put our hand up and we need to tell it as it is. And um, with the Collingwood situation at the moment, I think the number one thing that has to happen is Collingwood, who are going through a process, they need to put their hand up. You know, you can't. You, with um, this is with uh, the the Lumba. I forget his name, Harry O. But Her you know, Her Her yeah, Her the Lumba. Yeah, yeah, and and we all need to put our hand up, and and we don't have to, we don't have to say, well, it can't be. Oh, you know, I didn't do it, you know, so I, I can't take ownership. We all need to take ownership over this. And my, I love and Vicky, you, you mentioned I teach there in a diploma of sport. Yeah. I love it because the, the diversity we have. Is is just brilliant, and all, but no one seems to care where anyone sort of comes from. Um, and we have overseas students, we have internationals. Uh, we cater really for the West and the Northwest, uh, and we've got really different religions, different races, different, and everyone in there is just a student, and we all just get on with it, and it's just fantastic. Yeah, and that's one of my highlights of teaching at Vic Uni is the the whole diversity of that university. Can you tell us a bit about 
the skill sets of those those students because they come from uh, you know diverse backgrounds, and you know sometimes they can be um, subject to to not being included in things. Um, sadly, because there's racism that exists in our society. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Lots of lots of racism, um, and because it's a diploma course, we have students coming from whole range of learning environments. So we don't have an ATAR score to come in. Um, so we have students who have done VCAL, and I'll give, give my course a plug here because I really love this aspect of it. VCAL, uh, nice. VCE with no score, VCE, and they get a low score. So then, and they're not ready to go into a bachelor course. Um, some, now we have them for a year and we give them a whole range of different things, coaching, management, marketing, drugs in sport, a whole bunch, big project. At the end of it, most of my students go into higher education when they weren't ready for it 12 months ago, and most of them thrive in it. They then go on and go and do a master's, and then they'll go out and, and start to try and get jobs in the sports industry, which is not easy because everyone wants to work in the sports industry. But my students uh, or our students come out of that 12-month course and they get automatic entry. Uh, so no, don't worry about ATAR. Automatic entry if they pass the diploma into 13 different sport um, and recreation courses at Big Beauty. And I just love it. And I, I've seen them coming out the other side now and it's, it's brilliant to watch. That's fantastic. And those students, can you tell us some of the stories of any students that have progressed after, after doing the deployment of sport? Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you about Darren. I love Darren. He came in, uh, he won't mind me telling me this yep. story. He came in, I saw him five years ago. He was 35 years of age and he hadn't been at school since, and he was 15 years of age when he left school. He had not studied in 20 years. He'd been a labourer. He'd been, he'd worked in an abattoir out in the West there, been a concreter. And I remember saying to him, mate, I need you to put this PowerPoint together. And he looked at me and I said, you've know, got no idea what a PowerPoint is, do you? He goes, no. I said, don't worry, we'll be fine. Well, he's now got a master's in sports science and he's working with the Western Bulldogs in their women's program as a scout and looking at um, analytics in that program. Uh, he, he's, he did some work for the Calder Cannons um, and He's just gone like this. Yeah. He's, he's come out the other end um, and he had not been at school since he was 15 years of age. So there's, I, and I still keep him, I see him, I see him, I keep in contact with him. Brilliant. That's a great story. And it's, it's brilliant to hear that kids are coming out of that program um, and, and, and doing well after it. Uh, do you, do you really, how do you, how do you see, what are the biggest benefits that you think those students get? coming out of it and are there are there any other stories um you know out, out there that of students and why they should really come to vic uni to do that course oh there's a, there's a million every one of yeah. my students has got a, every everyone's got a story every one of my students has got a story everyone yeah. um i think the the thing they get out of it the most there's two things one is confidence we give them confidence that they they are they're good students they might not have been great students or didn't think they were at high school but after we've had them for a year, um, they're good students. They're really good students. They're ready to go on to higher education. The other thing, I, every and they're mostly 18, 19. Um, Darren was an older guy. I go, oh, what do you want to do? And they go, oh, I want to work in sport. Yeah, I go, How come? Oh, I love sport. As I always said at the time, my mum, who's passed away now, my mum loves sport too. Everyone loves sport. My mum was a sports nut, but she wasn't going to work in sport. So you needed mm. other reasons for that. Now, we help them work that out. And we help them work out where they want to head. So we give them a whole range of everything. So we take them into schools, for example. They do teaching. Half of my students walk out of the school going, boy, if I never see another bloody prep kid for the rest of my life, oh, I couldn't ever coach or teach. No worries. But I love sport management. I love it. Or I love sports science. The other half go, oh, that was fantastic. I think I might want to go into teaching now. So we give them all the experience. And so we help them decide so they have to make up their own mind where they want to head. So we give them a pathway, which is brilliant. That's great, Grant. And um, uh, the back to baseball, we'll go back to baseball. I want to talk about the development of the game. Where do you think the game can get support 
to, to really develop now going into the future? Uh, it's still Major League Baseball. They're, I mean, there is a world baseball body, it's world baseball softball, and they're good and they organise the world tournaments and things like that. But the big body for baseball in the world is Major League Baseball. Um, and the, the, every time we have a kid sign or they go into the college system, so the college system is massive for Australian baseball as well, even high school. But we would have, uh, I, lose, I lose track. I can't even, we would have over 100 players playing college baseball right now. All getting an education, uh, getting a college, a baseball uh, career in college. Now, some go on to be a professional baseballer. Most don't. They come back into our club system, back into the National League maybe, and they improve our level. So as soon as two or three players come back into Melbourne, they're finished, hopefully they've got a degree, they come back in, they go back into their club, the, the game elevates from there every time. And as I said, we've got over 100 players playing college and then I think we've probably got about 50 or 60 playing professionally. So there's there's 150 so players, not just in America, around the world, um, who are playing either to get an education or as a job right now, which... Yeah, there's not a lot of not not a lot of sports can do that. Well, Grant, it's been a pleasure to have you on uh, Brimbank Live and Live FM, the Sports Hour show. So we really appreciate your insights into your time in the uh, 1988 Olympics. Now working as a scout and you know really a baseball legend of Australia. So we thank you for coming on, and cheers once again. Well, thanks, Max, and thanks, Brimbank Live FM, for, for running shows like this. Um, I think it's great, and I think this is the future of future of media, um, these kind of shows. So uh, brilliant, and um, you're doing a great job there. Thanks, Grant. And that was Grant Weir, Australian baseball representative who was in the 1988 Olympics, uh, who was a pitcher for the national team. Post-career, he was a scout for U.S. baseball teams and also worked in other sports as a development manager. Now he's a teacher at the Victoria University teaching subjects in the deployment of sport. So we really thank Grant for coming on and I hope you enjoyed it.